Hello and welcome to Incompetent Basketry, which has been sponsored by Audible, but we'll get to that in good time. Now, if you want to learn a skill like basketry, I would recommend that you go to someone who's really good at it, and uh, that way you'll see that person uh, do things competently and immediately, and they'll be able to give you good advice straight away, and you won't be wasting a lot of time watching them bumble around and get things wrong and annoying you. Uh, on the other hand, if you're trying to learn from a video, then it could be good to watch someone who's never done the thing before have a go for the first time, and so, so you can see all the mistakes that you might make, and then you can avoid them. So possibly learning from someone who's incompetent might actually work. I don't actually know this. Now, I promise you that as I'm speaking to you right now, I have never ever done any basketry at all. All I've done is watched a few YouTube videos and uh, had, had a, a look at a book about it. Um, so, uh, what I did uh, yesterday is I soaked the willow rods. You know, you might not think it, but people are forever stopping me in the street and asking me, Lloyd, what exactly does 30 pounds of willow rods look like? Well, um, in case you are curious, and I happen to have uh, some about here. So this lot, which is supposedly eight foot long, but I've just measured them more like seven, uh, plus this lot, which uh, are um, five footers, I believe, um, come to about 30 pounds, just a little over. That's uh, 14,000 grams if you're French. Um, and what I need to do is I need to pick out a load of these and soak them in the water, and that's why I've come to this pond. Now, uh, if I were to try to make a basket out of uh, what I've got here, as soon as I bent anything like this, it would be all stiff and, yeah, did you hear that? It just cracks and breaks off, so that's no good. So I've got to get this pliable, and uh, to, to achieve that, I've got to soak them for the right amount of time. Now, this is called buff willow. Uh, it's been boiled in water for a while and had the bark removed. Um, this heat treatment means that it doesn't need to be soaked for very long to make it pliable. Only a few hours should be enough. Uh, for other types of willow that uh, haven't been treated in this way, uh, you're supposed to soak them for one day per one foot of length. Now, you might think that's a little bit odd because surely the water's penetrating in from the sides. Um, but, of course, the longer it is, the thicker the bases are. You see, if you look at the, uh, the thickness of the, the bases of these, they're a lot thicker than these shorter ones. Uh, so they take a lot more soaking. Uh, but, of course, that might mean you over-soak the thin ends. Well, it's all a compromise. I don't know how much of the water gets up the length, uh, up the end, and up by capillary action. Possibly that happens as well. I don't know. Anyway, I need to soak these for long enough for them to pass the 90-degree test. I need to bend them, uh, and they should go to 90 degrees without cracking, snapping, or popping. Um, and uh, to this end, I have got uh, uh, a dumbbell with some weights on it, and I've got some string uh, to weighing it down. I do, however, have a difficult decision to make, which is how much of this do I soak? Because I can soak too much. You need to soak enough to make what you want to make, and uh, you don't want to soak too much because there's a potential for it going to waste. So apparently, uh, buff willow is a bit more forgiving than other types. Um, so I've looked at some recipes, and I'm going to err on the extremely generous side because I really don't want to soak too little. That would be very annoying. So I'll probably soak at least twice as much as I think I need. Well, as you can see, I've got plenty left. I've got uh, these still in the bundles. Here are 100 rods and another 100 rods. I hope they're enough for two reasonably large baskets. And uh, I've got 24 of these seven footers. Will this be enough? I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I've weighed this basket, which is the sort of size I'm going to make, and it came to just 11 ounces. Now, I know that there's a lot of wastage uh, in this process, uh, and I'm just going to find out the hard way just how much. But uh, the recipe book said to use two pounds uh, for one basket, so that suggests over 50% wastage. Yikes. Anyway, uh, just in case you're worried about the fish, yes, there are fish in this pond, but I've checked with them, and they're absolutely fine about it. Uh, so, uh, in with the willow. This along the side, I think. Uh, ow! With a little bit sticking up for science. Right, now supposedly I bend it through 90 degrees. And yeah, it didn't crack, it didn't split, it didn't pop. I'm going to bend it. Okay, when I bent it through 
another 45 degrees and it did split but 90 degrees it coped with so I'm going to take that as, as done. Now I wrap this in a blanket and leave it overnight to mellow. Yeah. Uh, the longer ones I'm going to leave in for a bit. They have been in this blanket overnight and uh, here they are in all their buffy glory. Uh, still attached to the weights which I'll uh, untie now. Um, oh and there's a definite willowy smell has just hit me. I have assembled also a load of tools uh, in this box. I've got a board uh, which I might stick on my knee and, uh, and work that way. That's one way that basket workers uh, often work. Um, and in this box I've, um, I've got the, the Hong Kong Book of Basketry which uh, uh, should be handy and I've got uh, a plant sprayer filled with water uh, for dampening down things. Uh, also good for lubricating the, uh, the, the willow rods as you work, I'm told. I've got a couple of knives um, for cutting willow rods obviously and, and shaping the ends of them uh, and uh, I have a fear though that they might be a little bit sharp so I've got a blunt chisel as well um, for um, when you want to deliberately kink a, uh, a rod to bend it. I've got a big rounded stone for weighing down uh, my work as I'm working on it which is meant to uh, help. I've got some Vaseline for, for greasing the ends of rods when you're trying to jam on in a, a tough space and it might be uh, resisting you. Uh, I've got some uh, clippers for uh, clipping. I've got some garden secateurs which is what most basket workers seem to be using on YouTube uh, for cutting the ends off uh, rods and um, I've also got a load of clothes pegs for marking uh, particularly vital spots so that I remember ah don't weave past that one or, or whatever. Uh, a couple of clamps for holding something in place uh, while I do another thing. Um, now what I don't have is the weaver's main tool which is a bodkin which is a, 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 a tapering spike so uh, in its stead I've just got a, a Phillips head an old Phillips head screwdriver which I'm hoping will do the job. I also had a collection of long thin heavy things for beating the weaving down into place but I never used any of it. It's going to be a litter bin. Uh, a number of reasons for this. Litter bins uh, are generally circular and uh, everything I've learned so far suggests that a circular base is the easiest kind of base to make uh, and they don't have handles so that's another complication which I, I'm spared. So uh, and the sides can of course be pretty much any weave you like um, and so it's a good, I'm hoping, first time project, a litter bin. Another reason is that I do actually need another litter bin. The first thing I have to do is make the base. Using this one as my model for size, uh, the exact diameter of the base would be that, but I'm going to deliberately cut these long. So that's the length of my base stick. And I will need uh, six of these. And we have three going one way and three going the other. And uh, to this end, they're going to go through. So I need to cut some slits in the middle of them. And I can see that a couple of these have got a natural curve. So I shall use those for the outer ones because they need to bend in those directions anyway. I'm going to try with a chisel first. Yep. There you go, it's split quite nicely down the middle and then one of those can go through. Oops, I've never done this before. Oop, ah, uh, oh, okay, right, well, <laughs> my first failure. We have now uh, what's called a slath. I need to lash these together and you put two in through the through the slit and then you use these to lash together. So one goes over the top, one goes underneath the first and then you turn it through 90 degrees keeping it all wonderfully tight. Ah oh, they make it look so easy on YouTube. For those of you who've read your your SAS survival handbook by Lofty Wiseman. 
and uh, what, a, what a book that is. Um, we'll re recognize this as lashing. So we've got two uh, rods going round and round and they're quite fine. And uh, the books generally recommend going round twice. Okay, so I've now gone round twice and the center of the basket is held reasonably well together. Um, and now I start separating these bits. So instead of going all the way around all three of them, I bend this one out a bit and go in between it like that. And I have to say, so far, the willow rods are cooperating and being quite, quite pliable and strong. So how are we, how are we doing, Carl? Are we getting great close-ups? Looks great. <laughs> Now, a lot of people will say, ah, the equivalent of plastic for the olden days is pottery. And that's true. If you want to make something uh, that today we would make out of plastic, it's quite likely that you would make it out of pottery. Uh, so a, a potty, for instance, a child's potty today would almost certainly be plastic. I suppose it's easier to clean than ceramics. But uh, a potty was made out of, yeah, you guessed it, pot once. Um, a, a seat small enough for a small child to sit on you could make out of uh, clay and fire it and you could make all sorts of shapes with clay and of course it could be waterproof. In fact, if you weave tightly enough, it is possible, not with willow, but with uh, other, other materials, it is possible to uh, weave a cup that will actually hold water. Um, I, uh, I know that the uh, GIs in uh, the Vietnam War came across these uh, cups and were amazed by them in Vietnam. Uh, but basketry is, if you like, the other equivalent of plastic. So anything you're going to store or carry in, you want a rucksack, use basketry. You want to, to hang something on the wall, store something in the wall, um, uh, a child's cot, basketry. Now, I've wanted to have a go at basketry for decades, I've been saying. I, I want to go, go at this. And I know there'll be some people saying, that's a bit girly, isn't it? Right, well, you have to think, am I doing carpentry or am I doing weaving? You see, I'm working with wood, right? These are willow sticks, so I, I'm, I'm a carpenter. I'm working with wood and carpentry is a man's job. So uh, there you go. It's, it's a masculine thing to be doing. But wait a minute, I'm weaving. And weaving, traditionally, is a woman's job. So basketry falls in between. It's both weaving and carpentry. And so depending on where you are in the world, and what period, it's either man's work or woman's work, or either. Uh, in England, uh, I believe most basket weavers were men. So it came under something more like uh, carpentry than weaving. But really, it's neither one nor t'other. Uh, and there was a guild, of course, and they had as their symbol a knife, um, a picking off knife. It looks a little bit like this, but with a more uh, exaggerated uh, shaped blade, and that was for cutting the ends off when, you're, when all, you were good and ready and done. Um, okay, this is, this is going reasonably well so far, and I have to say it does feel pleasingly solid. Now, one thing I'm supposed to do is end up with a, a sort of a dish shape to this base. Uh, I want it to be slightly concave, convex, um, and nothing in any of the books or YouTube videos has given me the slightest clue as to how I achieve that. Um, so um, I'm hoping that it just sort of happens by accident if you don't do anything to prevent it. So I got to this stage after this amount of time. Should, whoa, ah, okay, it's broken. That one I kinked has now snapped. So uh, I will cut that off and I'll have to bring in a new one. I have to pull it to the side to create the space for it there. So it lies parallel. So the new one coming in is parallel where the old one uh, finished off. Uh, I'll just leave this sticking out for the moment. That'll be clipped off later. And then this then enters the pattern. You can see it is a little bit thick, but uh, close enough. Now it could be that these willow rods are a little bit on the dry side. Uh, the texture uh, I've heard described as leathery. That's how it should feel when it's been soaked the correct amount. Um, I suppose these feel a bit leathery, uh, but since I've never done this before, I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, uh, the splaying out now seems to be getting there. Um, that's near enough uh, even, clock face. Is that right? That doesn't feel right. <laughs> OK. 
getting. Now, one thing that makes me rather doubtful about what I'm doing now is that I've never seen anyone do it with this position of hands going. Another thing uh, that's developed here is I've got a twist. You can possibly see that that is not lying flat. Presumably, I, I have to do something about that, but I have absolutely no idea what. Take a new rod. And here we go, thin to thin. And um, almost all the, uh, the books and YouTube videos just say, stick it in just as before and off you go. But I did see one uh, lady who twisted the old and new together. And I quite liked that idea, so I'm gonna try it. So I twist the old and new thin ends, the tips together, and then weave with that. Um, that just feels right to me. Okay, so I'm now weaving towards the butt from the tips. And what we want to do is end with the tips on the outside so that this comes to a nice smooth uh, outer circular shape. So the end tapers, tapers, tapers. So you don't want to end with a butt, a thick bit, so that the outer circle has a step in its, in its uh, outer shape. Now, the reason you want uh, a concave uh, base for your basket is that um, even though you might think overall it's flat, of course it's made up of lots of little bumps. And so if you try for perfectly flat, there will be one bit which will stand up proud from all the others. And then when you put your basket down on a flat surface like a table, that bit will be the bit that touches the table and it will rock annoyingly around that bit. So better to have a concave base so that when you put the basket down on a flat surface, uh, the whole of the rim acts as the base of the basket and it doesn't rock is the, uh, is the theory. So far, no blisters or fear of blisters, but uh, in an hour or two's time, I may feel differently. Push that away from me just a bit. Ah, all right, let's cast, let's do that one first, and that one. Oh, we've got a big split in this one. Ah, I've introduced a bad rod. That didn't get very far at all, did it? I'm going to just live with it. I'm going to call that done, even though it doesn't have the wonderful dish shape that I'm supposed to have. Tuck it in. Ah, there's a nice couple of bits that are quite tight close together there so that serves well. Okay so um, well I can say it feels pleasingly solid. Uh, I don't feel that's going to go vroom and fall apart. I'm just contriving it by force at the end which seems to have just worked. So what you're supposed to do is pull the thing out and then so when you clip it goes twang back and then the ends hide in amongst the rest of the basketry, so, oh, that's not going to work. So this one here, for instance, I pull it that way and clip it there, and that you see it went twang back into the weave. So now you can't get, you can't snag your cloak on that. Oh, look at me here, snipping away with such assurance. I felt so competent. Oh no, that's really bad. <laughs> There's a definite weak point in my basket there. there. I've uh, mucked up. Just in case you didn't, uh, can't quite see the problem here, I have cut an end here in completely the wrong place. Uh, so, uh, whereas if I'd cut it in the right place, it would be um, tensed up against one of these uh, uprights. Instead, it's just in the middle. It's not springing out because it's jammed against another one, which is also cut in the wrong place. And I can see I've done it twice. I've done it here as well. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to, <laughs> I'm sorry folks, I think I'm going to have to undo the last two things I wove on. Ah, now this is a good sign, it's actually difficult to take apart. I'm sort of glad that I made a mistake, because if I just got everything right first time, where would the fun be in watching uh, in incompetent basketry? Ah, oh, do you know, I've just seen there's another one there. <laughs> that, Cal, there's another one here. I've managed to do it three times. I'm not going that far back. That one is just going to have to fend for itself. If I just jam it in, crush everything up a bit, it'll be fine. 
Okay, a lot of hobbies on YouTube have a community, and uh, it could be that uh, the basketry weaving community will, will find this you know, funny to watch because they'll like the fact that uh, someone decided to have a go and prove that actually it's not as easy as it looks. It has been made quite plain uh, from the books I've read that whereas an oval base is a fair bit more difficult than a circular base, a square base and uh, anything rectangular uh, is a lot more difficult. So it'll be uh, quite a while before I attempt something like a picnic basket. Other ideas I have for things to weave include, of course, a medieval authenti hat. But that'll be a bit of a challenge because that has to fit quite closely. Let's see if I can trim these off in the right places. That has to overlap that there, otherwise it'll fall out. Yeah, but it doesn't spring. Hmm. Not so satisfying, but uh, quite a bit stronger. It's not brilliantly circular, is it? Um, but I could maybe make it a bit more circular again, just by sort of after the... <laughs> okay, I just tried to shorten it that way, and I've now made it uh, over the other way. So that just shows you how plot... There you go! It's, it's even, even as we... Even as you watch, it's becoming more circular. This is where I have, I'm a bit nervous because I have to cut these right to the edge. So um, everything has to hold together. You, you hear me, Willow? Hold together. My first finished piece of wicker work, a wicker work plate. You can see these edge, these edge things go. Uh, 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 uh. Never mind, never mind. Okay, so now what we do is we stick uh, what are called stakes in the side and these are then pricked up that is to say they are bent uh, using a, a knife or some other tool and they then become the uprights which will then be the ribs for the sides. Um, now I found this a little bit of an, an odd idea. I would have thought what you would do is you'd have these uh, main ribs here continue, they'll be bent themselves and then go up the sides, but that's not the way it's done, it seems. You make the base separately and then the sides separately, and these are joined together in a way which is obviously strong enough. There are 12 ends that come off the six base sticks, uh, and if we put in one stake either side, that means that there will be 24 ribs that will go up the height of the basket. But they won't be evenly spaced because what you do is you stick them either side, like there and there, either side of the base sticks. Um, so those two will be very close together, and then this one and the next one closest, sorry, this one and the next one closest on this side will be quite a bit further apart, so the ribs don't start off evenly spaced. So it strikes me, surely is a good idea to stick a spacer in first, but you don't do that. Um, and so I'm going to follow the advice, um, and not do that, uh, and I suppose it's because you don't have to, and it's just uh, uh, something uh, that would be just more work. Okay, so I now need to select um, my sticks for the stakes. I've got a difficult decision to make. Uh, the, the Hong Kong Book of Basketry recommends picking thicker examples of these shorter sticks, but even the thickest examples aren't very thick. You are now watching me select the sticks that will make everything go wrong. Willow rods aren't perfectly straight. They are curved and the inner side of the curve is called the belly and the outer side is called the back, just like a bow. So if you imagine, if you think, think of my body as I'm sitting here, I'm sort of curved that way. So belly side is the inside of the curve and back side uh, is that. And I'm supposed to cut uh, from the belly, I believe. I get the sharp end of one of these and I jam it to one side of the base stick as far as it'll go. Get it in there. Girl, there we go. And then the next and so forth all the way around. This is getting awkward. Okay, so I'm gonna, whoa, there we go. Whoa, look at that, that's three 3D effects there. What? How badly have I managed to miscount? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. <laughs> oh, these ones here. Ah, right. Yes. Yes. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dan. You passed the test. I was wondering who was going to be the first. Uh, next time, Cal. Come on, quicker, quicker. There is always satisfaction in something that you've made yourself. Uh, so when uh, I, I finish, however this basket turns out, when I finish it, it, it will be the one I made myself and I can put it in one of the guest bedrooms and if they foolishly insult it, phew, don't think much of the litter bin in the room you've given me, uh, I'll be able to say, aha, well, actually, I made it myself. And then I can, I can watch them uh, backtrack and go, oh, why, oh, I see, yes, oh, well, it's actually quite good. And, uh, and then I'll know that they're lying because only seconds before they said it was rubbish. Oh. Oh, I don't have to do. I've now got all the stakes uh, shoved into the base from all sides and you'll see they are not evenly spaced. Uh, we have a pair here and then a bigger gap then a pair and a bigger gap and a pair all the way around. The next thing I do is upsetting. Uh, it's called upsetting uh, in the sense of setting as in fixing in place something up. So the next process is the upsetting. I have to um, put these so that they are vertical. And the first part of that is pricking up. Um, now with a thin rod you can just apparently with the thumbnail just <coughs> hoik it up. Um, but with a thicker rod you're supposed to use um, something like uh, the, the end of a screwdriver or even a knife where you stab it in and turn it. Um, which I'm not going to try straight away because the knives I've got are very sharp and I think I'm very likely to just cut through. And this willow is not particularly thick, so I'll start first with a thinnish one and my thumbnail. Um, now you don't want to go immediately next to the base because uh, you need to have room for the whaling, which is the, ne which is the, the, na the name of the next bit of weaving we're going to do. Uh, so I'm going to uh, come out a little bit, I'd say about there, and then I'm going to, yeah, that was fine. I didn't need to use any, any tool. Uh, now then, th hmm, ha, huh. that base stick is sticking out a bit much there, never mind. Ah, I know what's happened. Okay, right, I know what's happened. When I was pushing the stakes in, going round, I've compacted the weaving a bit, and that's why the base sticks are now sticking out a bit. I don't know what to do about it, uh, other than just carry on and hope. Ah, this might do it. Now the next stage is called uh, the whaling. Uh, this is part of the upsetting. We want to set these in place uh, in this upright position so that I can then get rid of this clamp, uh, which will make making the, e the, the sides much easier because I'll be able to weave in and out um, and, and place my willow rods between these and I won't get snagged by this. Um, the whaling is a type, it's a type of, of, of weaving pattern which you can actually use in other parts of the basket as far as I can tell. Uh, but it's specifically used at the bottom for the upsetting and it has a lot of, uh, has a lot of um, rods coming around the outside and holding everything in. For reasons I do not understand, you're supposed to put all four tips in the same place. I'm sticking them to the left of one of the stakes. Ah, and of course it kinks almost immediately. So that's behind one, that's behind two, that's behind three and that's behind four. Now then, why didn't I just put one there, one there, one there, and one there, and then just come up? I, I don't know. It, that seems easier and more logical, but this is the way it's done. And I suppose it doesn't really matter that much because they're so fine um, that they don't displace much. And perhaps the reason is that it's easier to jam four in because the four of them just are happier to stay jammed in because there are four of them. Anyway, that's how you start the, the, the whaling. And uh, now what do I do? Mark the stake to the left of the first rod. So, these are called stakes, so the rods are these. So the one to the left of the first rod is presumably that one, but it could also be that one, but that's to the left of all four of them. So I think it's probably meant to be that one. Take the left hand rod of the four, pass it across the front outside three stakes. One, two, three. Uh, carry it to the inside and behind one, bring it out again. So it goes, whoop. I'm having to use it like a rope. It's got so much... Ah, I've just kinked it. 
Okay, Whew. one. And it pulled out. <laughs> ha! And I'm supposed to now change from a four rod whale, I'm whaling and I'm using four rods, a four rod whale to a three rod whale. But why? But why? I have no idea. Uh, but it's in the book, so I'm going to do it. I'm hoping that when I've uh, finished the, the whaling um, and the upsetting, uh, that this process will get a fair bit faster. Is that enough to hold it up? Well, there's one way of testing. Uh -huh. yeah, it didn't go poof, did it? But you didn't help at all. At least it is largely hiding the edge of the base. That at least is happening. I have to say, I'm not enjoying this stage. Uh, Don't know, don't care. It's sponsor time, and my uh, generous sponsor is Audible, uh, which is an enormous website uh, that supplies audiobooks. In fact, uh, it boasts that it is the greatest, biggest supplier of spoken word entertainment in the world. I mean, I'm in no position to, to uh, contradict them on that. Uh, now, um, I am supposed to uh, pick out one of their uh, offerings as particularly relevant uh, to, to you and, and to this video, and um, I typed in basketry and pretty quickly uh, I got uh, basket making made easy. But I thought, you know, um, it's, you know, it's fine, it's certainly pertinent, but it's a bit niche. I, I doubt many of you watching this video are about to go, oh yeah, basketry, uh, that's for me, and you can take it up. But, but uh, I think a lot of you have had childhoods. I think that, that's, that's a far more widespread thing, and, and a lot of you will have children. And so there's the nostalgia, and of course you could have missed out on, on a children's classic like Type in various other words. Willow, you see? Wind in the willows, of course. Wind in the willows. Everyone loves wind in the willows with, with ratty rat and moly mole and, and, and toad and badger and, and all the rest of it. Um, I, I must have seen at least three stage productions of it when I was a little kid. Um, and some of you, I imagine, were probably in a school production of it when you were young. And uh, it's a great tale to introdu introduce to the young folks. So it's a major classic. So naturally, I thought they're bound to have uh, that. So I typed in The Wind of the Willows. And yes, they do have The Wind in the Willows. In fact, they have a lot of The Wind in the Willows. In fact, just ignoring the, the um, audiobooks about Wind in the Willows or, or, or um, having extracts uh, in them from Wind in the Willows and, and translations into foreign languages. No, just English language complete versions. I counted 41. Uh, so you're bound to find a narrator you like. Uh, I noticed that a lot of the narrators uh, had American accents, which for me is just wrong. But it's easy enough to just go um, click, listen to a sample, and go, oh, no, 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 that's, that's inappropriate. For th that doesn't sound a bit like Badger. And then, ah, that's the right voice for me. Click and pick that one. And if you do later think, oh, you know, I'm not sure even now that I picked the right one. Uh, perhaps I should have listened to a sample of every single one. Well, you can always swap them. Uh, you're not committed forever. And then uh, you, you can download it and then you keep it for free. It's yours forever and ever. This is not a streaming service. It's not a temporary rental thing. And there's an offer on, yes, a free 30-day trial if you go to audible.com stroke Lindy Beige or text Lindy Beige to 500 500 uh, then you can find all the details you'll need about that 30-day trial and you'll get one free audio book and you get access to the Plus catalogue, which all members have access to, which is loads of other things uh, which you can then get for free for that month. Um, so why don't you try audible.com? So what have we got? We've got a load of whaling, which on this side is reasonably vertical and seems to be uh, achieving the upsetting rather well. Although I do notice that this stake here doesn't seem to have many uh, rods woven around it on both sides. It just seems to uh, be rather... So you can see that one there? This, uh, this upright here seems to have... Um, seems to be rather isolated. It doesn't seem to weave through much. But never mind, it's, it's held inwards on the outside by the whaling. Uh, the whaling on this side, however, you'll notice um, uh, has got more flow. There is the term flow. Um, now this, this basket here, you see, this, this basket has flow uh, in that the sides don't go straight up. It isn't a perfect cylinder, but they go outwards slightly. So uh, the basket gets wider as it goes up. And uh, that 
is known as the flow of the basket. Uh, so you see I have a more pronounced flow on this side than on that. Um, this is very likely, I think, to prove problematic later on. I think the stakes were just not very symmetrical when I was weaving around them. I can also see that there's quite a definite gap here. It's there because I'm not very good at this. Now the, the, the weave that goes around the sides making up the bulk of the basket is called the randing um, and this particular recipe calls for French randing. Um, but I just want to make one thing clear that when the English use the word French in front of something it's not normally because it's actually from France uh, that's just too ghastly a thought. No, it's more to do with, oh, it's, there are two versions of it and one slightly fancier than the other, so we'll call the, slancy, the slightly ooh, the fancy version, we'll call that one French. Um, but this is perfectly authentic. A good stout Englishman of the medieval period would have done what, we, what is today called French randing. So please, please don't be alarmed. So it takes a bit of setting up, but I think the idea is that once you've set it up, you can go faster. <laughs> that didn't work at all. Right. The problem here is that some of these uprights are really not very upright. But if at the end of all this incompetence I have something that's even faintly usable, that'll be, that'll be nice, won't it? That'll be an uplifting message, I think, for you all. But I just put two in the same place. I should have marked, I should have gone to the left, not the right. Rather than work out what to do to put this right, I'm just going to pull them all out and start again. Okay, now what's happening now is I'm getting confused between stakes and weavers. Super tempted to just do English rounding. And of course the peg immediately gets in the way. Okay, I was not anticipating this bit being so flipping difficult. Uh, anyway, you can at least, I think, see that it's building up a radial uh, pattern of weavers. And when I finally got them all in the right place, I should be able to go reasonably fast. This weaver here is thicker than the stake and it's just bent the stake. Yeah, this vertical stake, I hope it's a vertical stake, yes it is, is, yeah, this one is not up to the task, it's too thin. And that's going to cause a problem every time I come past it. You remember when I was considering using the, uh, the longer rods for the stakes? But I decided against it and went with the recipe. I'm now regretting it. I now wish that I'd followed my instinct. Ah, it's all going pear-shaped here. Right, okay. Uh, Dan, you need to come in for a close-up here. Look, I've just tried again to put in this, this weaver here, but the weaver is so thick that when I did that, this uh, stake just collapsed. And I've now got a horrible kink in a stake somewhere where you really don't want it. If this stake were simply thicker, that wouldn't have happened. I'm moving the goalposts now. So what I'm now uh, saying is I'm trying to come up with uh, a, a rustic comedy uh, litter bin rather than uh, a, a bin with which to impress my neighbours. I am now most of the way around setting up the French rounding. What I suppose I could do is pull all the French rounding out and just do English rounding with a single, a single rod go around for a number of rounds. Perhaps it would stabilise it. Yeah, that's it. I'm pulling all the French rounding out. Filthy foreign rounding. I'm just going to go weaving in and out with a single rod. Simple as that. I get the impression that quite a few other people are doing basketry at the moment because I found it so difficult to get hold of this buff willow. Um, there were only two lengths uh, from this particular cellar left, and those are the two I got. Uh, not actually the ideal ones or the ones recommended in the books, but they were the ones that they had. So I bought five foot and uh, eight foot, which is actually seven foot. But remember, I'm making all these mistakes so that you don't have to. As I've come round trying to make everything tighter and tauter, by tautening stuff up, I've uh, caused looseness elsewhere and you can see these these top uh, uh, bits of the weave here are all just rubbish and loose. 
Um, and you can see that some of these vertical stakes are just horribly, horribly kinked. So uh, options that occur to me are that I try to add in replacement thicker stakes somehow, which uh, won't be great, but might be better than nothing. Uh, another thing I could do is actually have fewer stakes going around the outside by combining some of these uh, wimpier ones uh, with their neighbors into a single one. I suppose if I did that with two, they would then be an even number. Um, that might work, or I could just sort of carry on and I hope eventually that this will sort itself out, but I don't think it's ever going to. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, see, if this were a movie, I could just use a montage sequence and I could get myself out of this. Uh, lots of gritting of teeth and, and uh, you know, shots of me being horribly disappointed and then minor triumphs and then the, the music could change key and, and uh, you know, everything could turn out all right. Sh should we do that? <laughs>
uh, you might be able to throw together some baskets, useful for whatever the camp needed, uh, pretty quickly without having to uh, go through the seasoning process. But someone who's really into basketry uh, will have a, just thought another weaving mistake in, uh, will have a, a, a room full of seasoning willow rods somewhere. I shall put in two more uh, rods and then we'll put a rim on it. Because I shall free all the stakes and I shall pick one, not you. Go one and a half thicknesses up, uh, thicknesses of the stake itself, I assume, and then kink sideways from there. So about like that. And then I tuck it behind its neighbor. I do this for the, for the first three, I think. I'll leave it with a loose curve. Oh, ah, yes, I'm supposed to leave it with a, a bit of slack in it so that when I come around in the future, the second time, I've got somewhere to tuck in. That's going to be um, a little bit difficult. I'm, I think actually all these rods are starting to get a bit dry, so I'm going to spill the whole lot. Okay, another thing I have never used before is this, is this uh, particular spray thing, which I found. Uh, and now the joy of weaving, which is all wet, should tell me what to do next. No. Nope. Oh, great. <laughs> that doesn't look right. Uh, if everything were neat, it would be so much easier to see what I should be doing. Backtrack a bit. In front of one upright. Ah! Then bend it. Ah, okay, right, got it. Okay, clearly I've kinked everything too low down. And this follows it. So I'm having to put the second kink on, which is it's not a good look. But it is forming a border. Look, look, see, look, look, it's a, there's a border. It is a border of some sort. Yeah? Now, one thing that's concerning me is that the left hand one is supposed to go in front of one and then behind one. But the distance it has to go to get in front of that one seems to be <laughs> getting larger and larger as I go around, which it shouldn't. It should be constant. Right. But anyway, we're on the home straight now. Dan, Cal, you will see your families again. That will happen. It's the thought that this will be over soon, which is uh, <laughs> speeding me along at the moment. I have to say, though, that, you know, I, I do generally enjoy making stuff um, although one way to kill the joy of making stuff is to try to make stuff uh, and make a video about making the stuff at the same time more than any single thing that's made this basket rubbish is the fact that the, this steak and one of the others was just too thin and just kinked all the time i've got eight now of these rods ah you will now find the horizontal stakes in pairs in subsequent strokes, use the right hand longer one of the pair, leaving the left one behind to be picked off later. Yeah, should have done that probably about there, which is why you see our border uh, get this tight, and then this gets longer and longer and longer and oh dear, I'm uh, gonna have to go back. Ah, that's interesting. <coughs> this pair is three. Okay, I think I've uh, discovered the source of the problem. Notice there's one stake here that, uh, and guess which one it is, it's the floppy one. This is, this is good journalistic camera work. You see, um, a responsible journalist doesn't interfere. A responsible cameraman won't say, oh, we've made a mistake there. No, because he's here to document an actual event faithfully. And that's what he did. Uh, so well done, Cal. I, you know, I, I admire you for that. I've got loads of extra ones left that go to there but there's a, a space where I started that doesn't have any of those. 
Um, and I don't think that's because I've gone wrong. I think that that, that happens. So now I take it from the tip, whoop, take it from the tip, try to, trying to avoid kinking. And I hope you can, I hope you can see this as I tuck it in there, trying hard not to kink it, uh, which is not very easy. But if I make the angle broad enough, it should... Oh, I, 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 there's a kink, oh, there's a bit of a kink near the end there, but I, oh, that would have been difficult to prevent. But now I get out my bodkin for the first time and Jump that in to create a space for this to go. Okay. Ooh, bit of a kink. And another one. And another one. Oh, fortunately the kink was just where it, it's hidden. Okay. So it's really badly kinked ah, and it's broken and it's broken I'd have to unravel all the sides <laughs> I'd have to unravel the entire sides of the basket um, to replace it so that's not happening so I'm just going to tuck it in cramming off right take the right hand rod of the left hand pair <laughs> okay Tell me that. Which is the right-hand rod of the left-hand pair? Anyone? Dan? You, come on, you've been watching this the whole process. Which, uh... Ooh. Yeah, okay. It's a pair. So, do you know it might just be that one? It might just be that one. Um, I was wrong to cram it somewhere easy. I suppose it's in the name of it cramming. You've got to find a... somewhere to really cram it in. Never want to see you again. So there's going to be a lot of wastage. With, oh, it's split. Thank goodness we really learn from our mistakes. And thank goodness you can learn from other people's. I may as well come clean. I'm just sticking it in pretty much random places now. I can report my hands are fine, by the way. Uh, so is basketry really hard on the hands? Uh, not, not, not with this willow. And you'll be able to see that even with no particular weaving pattern and just shoving things in at random, you end up with a basket that works as a basket. And who really cares about what a basket looks like, yeah? Um, basketry, of course, also was the way people built houses and quite substantial things. Because uh, a willow hurdle can be a fence on your farm or you can cover it in door and it becomes one of the walls of your house. Uh, Possibly even load bearing, but maybe an internal partition. Uh, people would often have hurdles that would be kept readiness for whatever. You, you wouldn't necessarily know what is going to break in the future or what animals you're going to need to pen or whatever. So you'd have these hurdles, which are big, big panels of, of wicker work, which would be made in advance, stored in piles in a barn somewhere ready for the day. I pushed the bodkin where I wanted to go, but then the bodkin is in the space where I wanted to go. Um, not long now, not long now. Okay, I have a basket. It is actually pretty solid. You know, it, it could double as a rather fetching hat uh, in emergencies. Uh, I need to snip off the last few bits. This is wrong in almost every way. It's full of weaving mistakes. It's got, it's got gaps. It's got uh, kinks. Um, it's not symmetrical. It's not really round. It's, um, it's still got a few bits that are sticking out rather dangerously. Uh, um, but it's definitely functional. Right, so there you go, basketry. It's one of the fundamental crafts of the, the old world. Uh, we don't know exactly how old it is, but uh, baskets were around certainly uh, as, as far back as the Stone Age. I will not throw this away or burn it. I will keep this. This will go somewhere as a warning to others. New horizons in science now, as I demonstrate the, the strength, the structural integrity of basketry by standing 
on this uh, creation, which is, uh, you may, may remember, made out of just thin, pliable little sticks like this. I'm going to stand on it. I'm going to take my weight partly here first, and then I'm going to transfer my weight. And there's my full weight. There's my full weight on it there, and it didn't crush. It didn't crush. It's absolutely fine. Um, so there you go. Um, if you need a light and really strong fruit bowl, basket tray could be for you. <laughs>